Vamos a demostrar por qué es I'm going to demonstrate to you why the law of diminishing marginal productivity is praxeologically true. Just as the law of marginal utility is usually poorly explained, as if it were a law rooted in psychology or satiety, the law of diminishing marginal productivity is usually poorly explained. In almost all classes and textbooks, the law of diminishing marginal productivity is explained as if it were a technological law. In fact, so that you would grasp and visualize the idea in the example I gave you, even I presented the law as if it were technological in nature. And everyone says, well, what the professor is saying makes a lot of sense. On a given plot of land, in the beginning, there are so few workers that adding more workers makes productivity rise more than proportionally. Then there comes a point when more is still being produced, but an increasingly small amount more. An additional unit, an additional worker, does not produce proportionally the same, but less and less. And, if I understand this visual example the professor has described to us, if we continue to add units of the variable factor, eventually there might even be such disorganization and chaos, such bedlam, that less would be produced. Well, though this approach, paired with a graph, is effective in helping you visualize the idea, it lacks foundation. From the theoretical standpoint, the law of diminishing marginal productivity is not a technological law, the result of workers disturbing each other or not. It is a law that is strictly part of the logic of human action, and that is the main message I want to get across in today's class. In fact, this may be one of the most admirable contributions Mises makes in human action. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do something very important. I'm going to show you why the law of diminishing marginal productivity is universally valid. It always holds true. And furthermore, it is part of the logic of human action. And I'm going to demonstrate this a contrario sensu. What would happen if the law of diminishing marginal productivity or returns, which I have just explained, did not hold true? That is, the law that tells us that there are optimal combinations, that there is a level, a number, a volume of the variable factor, beyond which additional units result in ever smaller increases in consumer goods, diminishing marginal productivity. That's what the law says, nothing more. That beyond a certain volume, the curve must change from concave to convex. What would happen if the law did not hold true? What would happen if there were no optimal combinations of productive factors for generating a consumer good? If the law did not hold true, thus our a contrario sensu demonstration, it would mean that an increase in the units of the variable factor, in our example workers, would still result in a more than proportional increase in the final product, in our example potatoes. We would keep sending in workers. And what would happen to the output of potatoes if the law of diminishing returns did not hold true? Look where the curve is. I keep going up. I get to the ceiling and go up to the next floor. And I keep sending in workers. The third floor. The fourth floor. I get to the roof and continue up to the heavens. We could achieve any unlimited output of potatoes simply by raising the number of workers. Respecto del factor fijo. And what would this mean with respect to the fixed factor, the given factor, the plot of land in our example? It would mean that the plot of land had unlimited productive capacity, and therefore that it was not an economic good, a scarce resource, but a free good. Therefore, with higher order economic goods, factors of production, the law of diminishing marginal productivity must inevitably hold true and every economic good must by definition be scarce, that is, insufficient to achieve all the ends the actor intends to achieve. If the law did not hold true, that would mean the highest order economic good, or factor of production, considered fixed in the example, whatever it was, would have unlimited productive capacity, and therefore it would cease to be an economic good, it would no longer be scarce, it would be a free good. To put it another way, land, or the factor considered fixed, would be no restriction for any entrepreneur, since it would have unlimited productive capacity. 
and therefore no one would bother to economize on it. It would have no market price. It would be like the air we breathe which we take for granted and nobody bothers to economize on, nor allocate shares of private ownership of, nor exchange, because it has unlimited productive capacity. Therefore, inevitably, and inherent in the logic of human action and human nature, and starting from the premise that all economic laws are universally, apodictically valid and hold true whenever their assumptions are met, if we begin by assuming that both factors of production are limited and scarce, the law of diminishing marginal productivity must inevitably hold true. And we'll leave this law on the back burner for now, because it's very important. Without this law, we could not understand, two months from now, how the price of the factors of production is determined, what determines the price of the labor factor of production, wages, what effects follow from an increase in the population, or an increase in the well-invested capital workers use. The entire theory of capital and the entire theory of the cycle are incomprehensible if we do not understand that the nature of things is such that, from the standpoint of subjective valuation, the law of marginal utility determines the value of economic goods, and the proportions of higher order economic goods, or complementary factors of production, are subject to the law of diminishing marginal productivity, two basic laws around which our discipline revolves.